Uh, open your Bibles with me to Judges chapter 16, and we, we finish the story of Samson here tonight, and uh, we know that more space is committed to this man Samson in the book of Judges than any of the others, and it's our third week looking at his life, and we, we uh, can, can consider the, the, uh, maybe the most familiar story of Samson uh, here, and that's the story of Samson and, and Delilah, and we, we consider the, tonight the fall and the restoration of Samson. We'll finish the book of Judges uh, over the next two Wednesday nights. Next week, we'll look at Micah and his idolatry from chapter 17 and 18, and then, and then we'll finish the, the last three chapters, 19 through 21, uh, two Wednesdays from now as, as we consider the Levite and his concubine and, and the, uh, the, the tribe of uh, Benjamin uh, and, and nearly being wiped out off, off the, the face of the earth. But uh, it, it's uh, the, the sad end of the book of Judges over the next couple of weeks. Uh, then we'll have our Christmas play on, on uh, December 20th. And then on December 28th, we'll, we'll take a, we always take a break that week between Wednesday, uh, be, between Christmas and New Year. And then the first Wednesday in the new year, we'll have our prayer and fasting night. And, and then second Wednesday in, in uh, January, we'll pick up in the book of Ruth and, and start there fresh. And so looking forward, looking forward to that. All right, Judges chapter 16. Uh, Samson has been flirting with sin and, and f- um, uh, fiddling with sin and flirting with disaster. And it's going to finally uh, catch up catch up to him. The first three verses are a little bit of a microcosm of Samson's life as a whole. He was a man uh, that although had been set apart by the Lord, even from birth as a Nazarite to do the Lord's work, he was a man that, that never really learned to curb his fleshly appetites, uh, and he was driven by appetite, by, by lust and, and sensual desire. And it'll eventually bring him low, and and he'll he'll face the consequence. But but before the story, Delilah picks up in verse four. We just read of of just a little a small event in Samson's life that I like. I said is a little bit of a, a snapshot of his overall life. In verse one of Judges sixteen, it says, "Then Samson went to Gaza and saw a harlot there, and went into her." When the Gazites were told, Samson has come here, they surrounded the place and lay in wait for him all night at the gate of the city. Uh, They were quiet all night, saying, in the morning, when it is daylight, we will kill him. And then Samson lay low till midnight, then he arose at midnight and took hold of the doors of the gate of the city and the two gate posts and pulled them up bar and all put them on his shoulders and carried them to the top of the hill that faces Hebron disaster averted one more time (laughs) Uh, Samson won't always be getting away a couple of things about these three verses maybe first and foremost the word Gaza stands out to you especially with all that's in the news today and we think of the Gaza Strip and and why is it called the Gaza Strip well that particular portion on the western side of Israel was once a Philistine city called Gaza there were five main Philistine cities and and one of them named Gaza and in fact the the name Palestinian comes and its root from the word Philistine. That's where the word is taken from. So previously you had the enemies of Israel named the Philistines living in Gaza. Now you have the Palestinians accompanying the or inhabiting that that same spot of land. This does not mean, however, just so that we're straight and we don't we don't just they spout out things that aren't necessarily true. This does not mean that all Palestinians are directly uh, descendants of the Philistines. In fact, the, the name Palestinian, although it does take its root from the word Philistine, uh, was used primarily as a um, as, as, as more of a description of a, of a people that lived in a certain area, like we might say uh, those that live in Georgia or in the south of the United States, they're 
Southerners, it's not necessarily an, an ethnic group, meaning the, those that make up uh, w what we would call Palestinians today or Arabs of different national or different, different ethnic descent, we would say. Nonetheless, maybe the best, realization, best qualification of a, of a Palestinian today although at times that has included even the Jews living in Palestine, we'd say, today we would just understand them to be non-Jews living in the land, right? Okay, and so, and so right now there is, of course, a battle between Jews and, and, and Palestinians or, or Jews and, and Muslims in the Middle East. And, um, and, and it's a little bit of a, it's, it's obviously a little bit of a holdover from the conflicts that we see even arising in Scripture. It is indeed, it, it is indeed that. And, and I believe God has a plan for the Jewish people, but he's also a God of all nations. And, and so we, we, we remember in the present conflict that we were praying for Israel, that God would get a hold of their hearts, that he would win them back to himself. We remember that the nation Israel right now, uh, they, they are wayward and they don't believe in the Lord. And we're praying that the Lord uses the hardships that they're facing to chasten them and, and bring them back to the Lord, just as the Lord had us at other times, raised up nations around to attack Israel, even in Bible times, and so that Israel would be humbled and return to the Lord in repentance. So that's how we pray for Israel today. But we also know that God has a heart just in Bible times. He had a heart for the Babylonians and for the Assyrians and, and for the Egyptians, for all of those, even the ungodly nations that surrounded and at times chastened Israel, that the Lord also had a plan for them. And so we, we pray for the, the salvation of the Palestinians as well. And we just pray that, that in all things, God would be, be glorified and, and souls saved through, through Christ. Uh, that's a little bit of a side note. I just couldn't jump over the word Gaza without mentioning that to you. Now back to Samson. Uh, Samson here is, he comes to Gaza, a Philistine city. And one thing that just is important for us to note is that he saw a harlot, okay? And this was the same thing that was we read earlier in chapter 14 when he saw his first wife, that it was, it was the, kind of the lust of the eyes that, that drove him to this woman. So he saw her, the, the, the idea is that there was, there was a lust that then was generated by his gazing upon her, and then he went into her, and, and quite possibly what was he doing in Gaza anyway, other than maybe to solicit a prostitute, was hoping to, to wander in the path of one anyway. Anyway. And so he spends the night with her and his sin, and it's immoral in, in any sense of the word. Uh, his, his, uh, his ungodliness here then le leads to near captivity, okay? And so then when the Gazites saw that Samson had come, they were very much aware of it. It wasn't a secret sin by any means. They surrounded the place and they were going to capture him in the morning. And when the daylight arose, they said, well, we'll kill him. And, and they have an army there. And, they, and, and there, I think they were just hoping to be able to do so. He's already fend, him, fend off hundreds at, at one, any one time. And, and so they're, just, they're, they're hoping to be able to outnumber him. But, verse 3, uh, Samson only slept in his bed until about midnight, and, 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 and when they weren't aware, he grabbed hold of the doors of the gatepost, and he ripped them right out of the ground, bar and all, and he carried them up to the hill that faces Hebron, which is about about 40 miles away. <laughs> so here he is carrying the gates of the city just to prove his point for 40 miles. The dude had strength and it was in the Lord. Now listen, God enabled Samson to win several victories this way. Although he was given over to fleshly desires and fleshly whims, the Lord was with him and the Lord used him in spite of him, not because of his sin, but in spite of his sin. But Samson will then become a little bit arrogant here and he will, he will, go headlong into this next relationship with Delilah that would be his downfall. And so we're just one, one area of application for us right here, just real quick, is so important. Just because God is patient with us and uses us in the midst of our fleshly living doesn't mean that he's pleased with fleshly choices that we're making, nor does it mean that they won't ever catch up with us. 
And so in, in the book for, of First Peter, we, we read that we are to guard against fleshly lusts. We're to war against them because they war against our soul. And so God is very patient, but we should never misinterpret his long suffering for us as his acceptance of our, of our sin or, or sinfulness. And little things that, that we sow to the flesh can become monsters later on. And so that's why we, we need to be, be careful to be putting to death the deeds of the body as we're urged in, by the Apostle Paul in, in, in the New Testament. And so we see that, that Solomon's fleshly living will come now to, to bite him. And uh, there's an... Because there's an added layer. The, you could say the temptation steps up a notch. And that's in verse 4. It says, now afterward, it happened that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek. So that's the northern part of the, the Philistine region, whose name was Del- Delilah. Now, whether she was a Philistine or a Jew or a half-breed, we're not exactly sure. Some say a temple prostitute. We don't know exactly who Delilah was. But we do know this, that... Samson loved her, verse 4, which is a different word than it was used of his first wife when it, sa- when it says that he saw her and she pleased him and he said to his, his parents, get her for me for she pleases me. It was kind of a fleshly attraction Samson had to his first wife. And then with the prostitute at the opening part of the chapter, again, it was eyesight and he just simply lay with her. In neither of those accounts do we read anything about love. And meaning that here now there's an added temptation because here Samson is willing to let his guard down for this woman whom he dearly, truly loves. He has affection and affinity toward her. It doesn't seem like that's reciprocated by her for not only does she, uh, you know, berate him four times until he gives the secret of his strength but even on the last time after she calls a barber to shave his head uh, she begins to torment him and so she, it does seem like Delilah actually has something in her heart against against Samson and it, it's she's not just doing it for the money although she'd get a bunch of it uh, but nonetheless it's to say that maybe to shorten all of that up you're like yeah right uh to shorten all of that up, we could just simply say, Samson failed in the smaller temptations. So when he had a larger temptation come his way, he wasn't able to stand to that ultimate thing that would be his, his downfall, okay? And so afterward, he, uh, it tells us that he loves this woman, Delilah. And then verse five, and the lords of the Philistines came up to her and said to her, entice him. That, that would be to, to tempt him or to uh, cause him to yield. Uh, this would be a, a word that would uh, speak of, of using speech to cause someone else to go astray or to go in a way that they would not otherwise go. It's used of uh, the temptation of sexual allurement in the scripture. It's used of the temptation of, of sinners calling righteous people to go astray. And, uh, and so they're certainly asking her to come in and to convince Samson to do something that even he would not otherwise do. And what is that? What is that? It wasn't sexual immorality or eat something that he wanted to eat because we've already find him doing those things. But it was, it was to, to cash it all in, which would be for him to be honest about the source of his strength. And so the Philistines want to know, find out, where his great strength lies and by what means we may overpower him. And every one of us will give you 1,100 pieces of silver. So 1,100 pieces of silver would total about 28 pounds. And there were five lords of the Philistines. So this would be 140 pounds of silver. Delilah's about to get rich. (laughs) And so she's like, okay, okay, I'll sell him for 140 pounds of silver, So she does exactly that. Verse 6. So she said to Samson, please tell me where your great strength lies and with what you may be bound to afflict you. And Samson said to her, if they bind me with seven fresh bowstrings, yet not dried, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. 
So the lords of the Philistines brought up to her seven fresh bowstrings, not yet dried, and she bound him with them. So what was a bowstring made of uh, in Delilah's day? A bowstring would have made, been made of animal intestine. So this would have been a sinew from the inside of an animal, not yet dried. What's Samson doing here? Samson was a Nazarite. What was Samson not allowed to touch? A dead body or any part thereof. He's kind of almost tempting the Lord. He's like, he's like bring it. He had already climbed up in the carcass of that lion and stole that honey, right? So he knows he can get really close to sin. He can sin. He can actually do lots that he's not supposed to do and still wiggle free and maintain the Lord's blessing on his, on his reign as judge. And so he's, he's, just, he's just almost tempting the Lord here. And so that, sure enough, no sooner does he say this, that here come the Philistines with seven uh, fresh uh, bowstrings, <laughs> uh, and she binds him up. And uh, and verse nine. Uh, now there were men lying in wait, staying right there in the house, <laughs> staying with her in the room. Like she's like, oh, they're right here in the closet. And she said to him, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. Uh, but he broke the bowstrings in a strand of yarn, as a, a strand of yarn breaks when it touches the fire. So the secret of his strength was not known. Now, there's no mention here of Samson waking up as in two other times you read that. And so maybe she eventually would have to coax him to sleep. But it could have been just like this. What's the secret of your strength? Seven fresh bowstrings. Knock at the door sometime later. Here's the Philistines with seven fresh bowstrings. She says, put your hands together. He puts his hands together. She ties him up. Then she goes, yoo-hoo. And these guys come out of the closet and uh, go to get him. And he just breaks him off and beats him up and chases them away. And at this point, you're thinking, Samson. And even if he was asleep, when he, if he wakes up, he's like, wait, how do I get seven fresh bowstrings on me? And these guys on top of me, like, you're thinking like, He's, you know, like, this gal probably shouldn't be trusted, <laughs> but, to say the least, right? But what's going on in his heart? He loves her. He loves her, and he's willing to compromise for her. And this, this affection that, that has gripped his heart now is something that is, is he's like a moth to the flame. And so this is going to happen three more times. The last one will be the one that will do him in. Then Delilah said to Samson, look, you have mocked me and told me lies. Now please tell me what you may be bound with. So he said, well, if they bind me securely with new ropes that have never been used, then I shall become weak and become like any other man. Samson had enough self-awareness to realize that his, his strength was... Uh, uh, was supernatural and apart from that special strength that had come that he would be indeed like any other man. Uh, but verse 12, therefore Delilah took new ropes, bound him with them and said to him, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. And there were men lying in wait, staying in the other room. But again, he broke them off his arms like a thread. And same, same result. Then verse 13, then Delilah said to Samson, until now you have mocked me and told me lies. Tell me what you may be bound with. And he said to her, if you weave the seven locks of my head into, a, uh, uh, into the web of the loom, uh, and no, he doesn't even finish his statement. And so she's like, okay, quick, let me do that. So she wove it tightly with the batten of the loom and said to him, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. But this time it sounds like as she was playing with his hair, at least he fell asleep because now he has to wake up. And, uh, but he woke from his sleep and pulled out the batten of the web from the loom. And again, you know, obviously chased off the Philistines. And so he had probably had his hair braided into seven long braids and, and, uh, and that. Again, it's a little bit of a tempting of the Lord because what's he doing? He's getting a little closer to the truth. It, it, he didn't say, cut my hair, but hint, you're getting warmer, something to do with my hair. And, and, and he's, very, he's just right on the doorstep. He's right on the doorstep. But what is she saying? You mock me with your lies. 
She's kind of saying, you don't love me. In fact, she will say that. It's me or them. It's like me or your God. It's me or your strength. You got to choose. And you can't, you can't play in both, in both yards here. You love me, you got to be all in. in. Verse 15. She said, how can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? <laughs> you know what? I think the Lord could say the same thing to him, don't you? How can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? Hmm. You've mocked me these three times and have not told me where your great strength lies. And uh, and it says, and it came to pass when she pestered him daily with her words and pressed him so that his soul was vexed to death that he told her all that was in his heart. And so we just see that Samson, like the book of Joel says, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. Or Elijah said, how long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal's God, follow him. Or Joshua said, choose this day whom you will serve. And and, and Samson came right to it. She's like, if you love me, you better tell me. And you could hear the Lord saying, if you love me, you better not tell her. And Samson had a choice to make at this point. He had to follow his heart. And would his heart go after sin and after this relationship? Or would his heart choose the Lord? And his choice was catastrophic. You know, the Lord says to us, he says, if any of us love our father or mother, children, land, or anything for more than him, we're not worthy of him. And the Lord above all says, that we are to love him with all our heart. This word love that she's using here is the same word that we read in Deuteronomy 6, 5. That we're to love the Lord with all our heart. You know, and she, and she was saying, you better love me with all your heart. She's pulling a man away from his God. And Samson was happy to have it so. He didn't want to give in, but she pressed him daily. And he was vexed to the point of death. And here's where Samson caves, it's verse 17. And he's honest. And he never knew how much. But he says, then he told her all his heart. (laughs) He just laid it open. And he said, no razor has ever come upon my head. For I've been a Nazarite to God. It's the first time Samson Samson mentions God. (laughs) I've been a, a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. And if I am shaven, then my strength will leave me and I shall become weak and and be like any other man. And it's here that Samson recognizes that the source of his strength is from the Lord. And notice he says, if I am shaven, then my strength will leave me. He knew of it. Well, verse 19 when Delilah saw that he had told her all that I uh, told her all his heart, she could see this time was different. She sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up at once, for he has told me all his heart. Maybe they were weary, you know, like the boy who cried wolf to come again, but uh, something was so convincing about her words this time that they, they came back. Uh, uh, so the lords of the Philistines came up to her and brought the money in their hand. They're ready to pay her. Then she lulled him to sleep on her knees and called for a man and had him shave off the seven locks of his head. And then she began to torment him. And, uh, and that's not just try to awake him, but, but there was uh, the, the, the Hebrew word for torment there really does mean torment that she was, uh, here's where we see not only for the money she's doing this, but there was some ill in her heart toward him and whether she felt slighted because he wasn't honest immediately, or maybe she was a Philistine or we don't know, but there is something truly in her heart against him and she's hurting him here. And, uh, and it says, his strength left him. And so, again, I want to draw your attention back. 
Samson said, my strength will lead me, leave me. And then it says, his strength left him. And then verse 20, and she said, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. So he awoke from his sleep, and this was what he thought in his arrogant heart. I will go out as before at other times, every time I've trifled with sin, and shake myself free. But he did not know here that the Lord had departed from him. And I wanted to call your attention just to the specific phrase in the wording. He says, my strength will leave me. And it says, his strength left him. And then in verse 20, the Lord had departed from him. And the word departed is the exact same Hebrew, Hebrew word than left. What was his strength? It wasn't just the Lord is the source of his strength, but the Lord was his strength. And the Lord had left him. It wasn't just his strength that was gone. It was his Lord that was gone. And the word for depart, it, it means to abandon. It means to desert. It, uh, it means to, to turn away or go far away and even to keep away. <laughs> and here was the Lord who was ever near to Samson in all his life. From the time of his birth, he was born in Nazareth. And he had always known the nearness of the Lord. And now the Lord was no longer near him. The Lord had departed from him. And so, with the Lord's departure, the Lord's strength. And David said in Psalm 18.1, he said, he said, I will love the Lord my strength. <laughs> Not just he is my strength, but my strength. I will love the Lord my strength. And they wanted to know where. In fact, the word source isn't even in the Hebrew. They said, where does your great strength lie? Where, where is your strength? And it's, it reminds me of Psalm 121, verse 1 and 2. From whence comes my help? <laughs> like, where does it come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And when we, when we trifle with sin, we're, we're, we're trifling with none other than the Lord's very presence in our life. It's just his nearness and his goodness to us. And we say, Lord, I don't need you. I can do this. I can do it all on my own. And you know, the Lord, is, the Lord has called us to be near to him because he is our strength, not just the source of our strength, but he is our very strength in and of itself. And we'd say, Lord, I want to just be near unto you. And that was, that was Samson's great downfall. And then to borrow the, the most common three-point sermon, and whoever, whatever preacher came up with this first, the Lord only knows and gets a prize, and the rest of us are copycats. Uh, it'll get sorted out in heaven. But here's the problem with sin, verse 20, 21. It says, then the Philistines took, took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza. Then they bound him with bronze fetters and he became a grinder in the prison. And it's, it's uh, the most famous three points from any one verse in, in the Bible. And it says that sin blinds, sin binds, and sin grinds right there. <laughs> so they bound him. They put out his eyes, he was blinded, and then he came down to be a grinder in the prison. But it's fitting, and sin does, uh, so I'll steal it and use it. How's this? It's exactly what sin does. It blinds us to the reality of what's going on really around us. And we, we are duped, and we think it's one thing, and it's actually another thing. And, and we're just foolish walking into it. And then, and then it binds us, and we, we get into sin, and we realize we're, we're hooked, and we're, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And then, act, and then eventually it just grinds, it just, it weighs us down. And, and here's Samson, eyes put out, bound, and he's a grinder in the prison. And, and it's been said of sin that, uh, that it'll cost more than you ever wanted to pay, and it'll take you further than you ever wanted to go, and it'll keep you longer than you ever wanted to stay. And, and, it's, and it's, we're warned of this. We see the pitfall and the shipwreck in other people's lives. And so we think we, we can get away with it. And that, that I'm the one that doesn't have to listen to the Lord. And I, and I can take shortcuts and I can just shake myself free as at other times. 
and until the Lord says that that's it, and he takes his hands off, and, and, and that's where Samson would be, and he would, he would live out the rest of his life in, in the Philistine prison. However, verse 22, <laughs> the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaven. And we get to the restoration of Samson here. And we'll conclude with the communion table tonight. And, and I'm thankful for, for the passage leaves us right at the foot of the cross. Something I think we all need right about now. In verse 23, and it says, Now the Lord of, of the Philistines gathered together to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their God, and to rejoice. And they said, our God has delivered into our hands Samson, our enemy. So they begin to mock him, and, and they're rejoicing. And it's a great gathering of the Philistines there, and they're, they're worshiping Dagon. Of course, Dagon will show up later in, in, in Philistine camp in the days of, 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 of Samuel, and, and when the ark is brought and, uh, after the capture in Eli, he'll remember that Dagon's fallen down before the ark of the Lord. But this is before then, and Dagon's still very much upright, and they're still worshiping him. In verse 24, and when the people saw him, they praised their God, and they said, Our God has delivered into our hands our enemy, the destroyer of our land, and the one who multiplied our dead. And so it happened when their hearts were merry and drunk, that they said, Call for Samson, that he may perform for us, treating him like a clown. And so they called for Samson from the prison and he performed for them and they stationed him between the pillars. Then Samson said to the lad who held him by the hand, let me feel the pillars which support the temple so that I can lean on them. Now the temple was full of men and women. All the lords of the Philistines were there. In fact, there were about 3,000 men and women on the roof who watched while Samson performed. Then Samson called on the Lord. And said, O oh Lord God, remember me, I pray. You know, the Lord would remember him. The Lord would not forget him. And he says, strengthen me, I pray, just this once, O oh God, that I may with one blow take vengeance on the Philistines for my two eyes. Even in his, his last call upon the Lord, Samson still utterly self-focused and it's sad to see. But nonetheless, the Lord was merciful and the Lord heard him. And in verse 29, and Samson took hold of the two middle pillars which supported the temple, and he braced himself against them, one on his right hand and the other on his left. In verse 30, then Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And he pushed with all his might, and the temple fell on the Lord's and on all the people who were in it. So the dead that he killed at his death were more than he had killed in his life. And his brothers and all his father's household came down and took him and brought him and buried him between Zorah and Eshtaol in the tomb of his father Manoah. And he had judged Israel 20 years. And so we see even at Samson's lowest point that his hair began to grow back. The Lord pitied Samson. And in Samson's cry, at the very end, the Lord was with him. And there was more dead at his death than in his life. And I say this leads us to the foot of the cross. We were about to finish with some worship and, and uh, come to the communion table. We'll take the bread and we'll remember, remember the Lord's body broken for us and we'll take the cup and remember that his blood was shed to forgive our sin. And it's here that we consider Samson as a type of Christ. Yes, I said it. <laughs> Samson is a type of Christ. From his birth to his death, Sovereignly called, an angel announced his birth, a miraculous birth. His barren mother had a child. And we think of the Lord's virgin birth announced also by an angel. And from his youth, Samson was set apart to do the will of God. Samson is a type of Christ, one of the types of Christ by way of contrast. That Samson was an utter sinner his entire life. <laughs> and Jesus was utterly sinless his entire life. But nonetheless, it would be at the end where Samson would be betrayed by one he loved, as Jesus was betrayed by one he loved. And there would be the Lord would go to the cross, and Samson died with outstretched arms. And there would be more dead at his death than his life. 
And even Christ died with outstretched arms. And of course, he won his bride, not through his life and through his example, but by his death as he went, as he went to the cross for us. And we think of Samson, quite a, quite a deliverer, an unsuspecting deliverer. And here's Jesus right, raised up. And it was even said in somewhat of a play on words because nowhere in the Old Testament does it say that Jesus would be born in Nazarene. But in the end of Matthew chapter 2, it says that he would be raised in Nazareth. As it is said, he would be called a Nazarene. But we know that it's really maybe even a fulfillment of this, of, of a Nazarite, of one that would be, uh, that would be uh, following in the ways of the Lord. And, uh, and here... Jesus comes and, and he, enters, he enters the text just that way. And we realize that all of us, we are but at, under shepherds at best. <laughs> if anybody will be saved, it won't be because of our holiness, it won't be because of our godliness, but it'll be because of the work of Christ in us and the work of Christ through us. But nonetheless, he desires that we, as we abide in him, and as we walk closely with him, that our ministry is protected and preserved by godly living. Because as we put ourselves in his pathway, what we're guarding is his nearness to us, our nearness to him, and he indeed is our, is our strength. And so the, the uh, glorious story of, of Samson is it points forward to a deliver, deliverer <laughs> altogether higher and greater, and more supreme than he, uh, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who died and rose again, that we might have life. Let me say the Lord bless you and keep you, and, and watch over you, abide in him, and as we come to the communion table now, know that as you, as you make your heart right before him, and if there's something in your life that the Lord is saying, if you love me, depart from that, and that thing saying, well, if you love me, depart from the Lord. You make your choice right here at the foot of the cross tonight. And you make your choice to love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And if you failed and if you faltered, you know that the blood of Christ is rich to forgive you all your sin, to renew in you again a steadfast spirit, a right heart within you, that you might follow the Lord effectively and fruitfully in your life. On Wednesdays when we share in communion, Dennis, you can bring the worship team up. On Wednesdays when we share in communion, we, don't, we won't pass out the elements, nor will we pause at any one point and take them all together. So as we finish with some worship, uh, feel free just to come, take the bread and the cup and go back to your seat and just spend a quiet minute with the Lord and pray. Remember his body that was broken, his blood shed. And we say in communion, that's time to look inward and confess our sin. But it's, but it's more than that, much, much more than that. It's a time to look upward where we see the finished work of Jesus on the cross. So it is a time of examination, but it's also a time where we declare and proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. It's a time where we can sense, again, God's free grace and nearness and where we can walk out here with fresh consciences, clean and, and right before our God. Father, we thank you uh, for... Uh, for the story of Samson from the Old Testament, how it points us to you and uh, your work and it warns us and pushes us away from sin and, and to the blood-stained cross, the side of our Savior who died for us and rose again. And Lord, we say we love you. And Lord, we choose you. And Lord, would you forgive us for sinning against you and for choosing um, other ways beside you Lord, that we might always walk with you and love you and cleanse us, and remind us of your love and send us forth from here, Lord, uh, with, uh, with hearts clean, sprinkled from an evil conscience, bodies washed with pure water, that we might serve you fruitfully and effectively all our days. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.